Okay, I think we will begin. Um, hello, everybody. A warm welcome to the Sound Arts Lecture Series hosted here at London College of Communication um, in association with CRISAP, which is the Creative Research uh, into Sound Arts Practice Centre, also at LCC. Um, as many of you know, my name is Mark Peter Wright. I'm the acting course leader for the BA Sound Arts course, and I'm a member of CRISAP and I've convened this term's speakers for you. Um, so I hope you enjoy this. I will introduce our brilliant guest speaker today, um, Lena Ortega, soon. But as usual, I am going to do some housekeeping things um, for students mainly, um, but also for members of the public. Um, and on that note, I always say that I, I do think this is a very unique space um, because it contains um, BA, MA, PhD students and also members of the public. So it's quite a unique um, mixture that we have here today. So I always make that little noise, it never works, there we go. Um, within this sort of mix, if you are a UAL student, please use your full name as your username. Um, and also if you're an external guest, please do put your full name um, in if we can't identify you. Um, you will be asked to leave the session, unfortunately. And please just be mindful that this is a public forum. Um, we always say the chat messaging function is a very good way to remember that. Um, so the chat is, is archived as well. Um, we might have microphones on and off for part of today, we're not sure, but um, just as a default, just keep them off until we get to the, to the Q&A, unless requested otherwise. And a reminder that these sessions are recorded. Um, and that does include the chat as well. For students, this is your attendance um, code for today. Um, you can scan that with your phone. Um, the password is 0187BL. I will pop this in the chat afterwards, so don't worry if you don't have time to, to scan it now, I'll pop that in the chat. And just once again, I always make a point of saying this, the, the Q&A is a very brilliant opportunity to ask um, questions and a question doesn't have to be overly complex. It can just be asking for more information about a certain topic you found interesting. But I think um, as always use the chat to log your questions and comments, do use it throughout the talk. Um, even if it's just a kind of feeling towards a work that's being shared, um, use it as an ongoing dialogue for yourself and for the community that are watching and, and listening at the same time. And then we'll pick, pick up the questions at the end of the session. Um, so, so do bank them up and, and get them in the chat. Okay, so today's uh, speaker is Lena Ortega, AKA Lee Lee, who is a Mexican sound artist, researcher, designer, and teacher specializing in nature culture relations with a focus on soundscape ecology, bioacoustics and field recordings. Through practice-based research, she aims to cultivate the community's ecological consciousness by involving listening practices, field observation, recording and soundscape composition. The main focus is the bird population, individuals of nearby surroundings and how they relate to and are part of their territory. And I will leave it there for now. And I think just hand over to um, Lena, who's going to sort of open up and, and share lots of, of things with us. So just thank you once again, Lena. And I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And hello to everyone, wherever you are. And um, here is quite early, at least for me. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you, I would like to start um, this talk off by uh, doing a simple exercise. And this exercise is an adaptation, we could say, from one of Pauline Olivero's uh, deep listening exercises. So and this is a suggestion, but I would uh, like to ask um, you who are out there to please sit on the edge of your chair, just as close as possible to the front. And if you're able to lay your feet, like put your feet on the floor, 
and have that um, contact with the floor, that would be great. And we'll just try to bring our mind to this moment present. Focus on our breathing. Take a couple of breaths together. And then let's see what happens, but I would like to, for everyone to open their microphone and put on their camera. And, you know, it's always um, a challenge to be together online, but I'm sure that we can use strategies to do so. And while everyone is doing that, um, I would like for you to close your eyes and try to uh, listen to your heartbeat. If you're having a complicated time in doing that, you can, you know, put your fingers up here, you can touch your wrist, you can put your hand on your chest. And once you think that you've actually got it, the beat, then I would like for you to just start tapping it lightly on your any part of your body or even the chair or wherever you are. And once you think you've got that going as well, then we can clap it out. And the exercise will stop when we're all clapping. So just take your time. This is all no rush at all. And I'm gonna close my eyes as well.
I don't know how everyone is doing. It's hard to get to the clapping part, <laughs> but it's not that easy actually. Um, and I really love this exercise because it just, I think it gives us an opportunity to kind of um, be at this same place, even though it's virtual, kind of connect with each other, even though we're really far away. So thank you for doing this with me. And um, yeah, I invite you to try it out another, another time and see if you can get to the clapping. And the challenge is to not synchronize with the rest, you know, and just be able to keep your own beat. Okay, so uh, yeah. So again, thank you for being here with me. And I'm going to start this presentation. I brought uh, several things for you today. I would like to share my research, and that's what I'm going to do first. And then we're gonna listen to a couple of pieces. And um, yeah, so if you have any questions, just please let me know at the chat. And I will start now. Okay. Um, I hope you can see my screen. So as Mark uh, said, I work in the intersection of nature culture through sound. And this is the name of my talk today living with more than human entities from care, dialogue, and accompaniment, an environmental approach to sound. And these are the three uh, concepts that I'm using at the time or that I'm researching. And I have uh, written something quite short that I would like to read to you. So again, if you'd like to close your eyes maybe, and yeah, you don't, I'm just gonna be talking for a little bit here living with more than human entities. The notion of dominance, characteristic of Western heteropatriarchal thinking, has primarily shaped and limited the frameworks of thought with which we relate to and inhabit the world. This mindset commonly works from opposition and hierarchy, active and passive, the ones who make decisions and the ones who abide by them. VTIC 2006. These frames of thought have also permeated our relationships with nature, the environment, and non-human animals, which exist, become meaningful insofar as they serve a purpose regarding us. For instance, human animals classify and discriminate against non-human animals hierarchically within species of more or less importance, according to their purpo purposefulness to us. These hierarchies are used to determine which non-human animal lives and which non-human animal dies, since some are worthy of moral consideration while others are not. Beckoff, 2013. Likewise, they're used to determine which animal deserves better, more specialized care, and which one less so. Some domestic companion species, such as dogs and cats, have much more specialized care than others, such as domestic birds. Ortega, 2021. In recent years, however, we have begun to understand culture and nature as inseparably and complexly intertwined. What more, 2002. Nature is no longer something different, divergent, or ulterior. We now embrace the notion of causal reciprocity between organisms and environments. 
Living organisms condition the environment, which is, in turn, conditioned by them. In contemporary biology, the relationship between organisms and their surroundings is mutually affecting. The current state of ecological emergency is irrefutable proof that we need to figure out how these and other newly found realizations can reshape our relationship with nature to foster fairer, more respectful, less anthropocentric approaches to nature itself, the environment, and non-human animals. We need to learn to live with, live with others from an environmental mutually affecting perspective. For this reason, alternatives to dominant frames of thought are increasingly necessary. Oh, and I forgot I was going to start with this quote, but I'll just uh, start uh, read this quote right now. Salome Fogelin explores listening as an act of relating to the world. Rather than perceiving in the world, listening is about resounding with the world of which I am part of, of which all others are. She defines silence not as the absence of sound, but as the beginning of listening. Care, accompaniment, and dialogue are dimensions of reality that differ from a dominant perspective. These notions have commonly been neglected in dominant frameworks of thought and their representations. As proposed by philosopher Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, the dimension of care challenges how traditionally, in the representation of things, the meaning of affective and even loving connection has been overlooked. Her proposal aims at displacing the boundaries of care in several aspects, namely by setting this category against issues and debates that do not frequently address or touch upon it, yet not so much by engaging with a critique of care as other contemporary critical reorient reorientations. Instead, thinking about care as a disruptive doing that can open up other configurations engaged with troubling presence. Staying with care's potential to disrupt is not only about making visible the neglected activities we want to see more valued, for instance, as productive activities with an economical, as well as other forms of worth that should be recognized. It is also about engaging with the situated recognitions of the importance of care that are displaced and established hierarchies of value and understanding how divergent modes of valuing care coexist and co-make each other in sometimes devious ways. In terms of the ecological agenda, implementing her proposal could mean opening up incongruencies and divergencies in current discourses on eco-moralization and eco-ethics or the recognition of non-human animals' idiosyncrasies and subjectivities. It could also mean approaching nature from a non-instrumentalist per perspective where nature exists insofar as it serves a purpose with regards to us. The deployment of the idea of care is linked to the notion of accompaniment that underlines nature writer Nan Shepard's approach to the environment. She recounts how, over time, she learned to go into the mountains of the Cairngorms in Scotland, her home country, with no other purpose than to be there, without seeking to reach the summit of the mountain or dominate their environment as one visit of friends with no intention but to be with, Shepherd 2011. At the time, her manner, manner of venturing deeply, relating lovely, lovingly into the mountain's life was not considered acceptable. She could not find anyone interested in publishing her work, perhaps not even valuable within the, within the frames of nature writing. Shepherd spent hundreds of days and walked thousands of miles exploring these mountains on foot. She came to know places closely, slowly, and this closeness broadened and intensified what she grasped from her, from her surroundings. As a result, some of the interconnectivity between the different realms and dwellers of the mountains became apparent, as did the elusiveness of nature itself. The more she knew about the mountain, the more she refused a singular perspective on it and its ways. Knowing another is endless. The thing to be known grows with the knowing. Shepard's notion of a campaign through walking relates to the idea of dialogue that underpins the concept of sound walk as developed by German-Canadian composer, radio art artist, and environmentalist Hildegard Westerkamp. 
which refers to an excursion with the sole purpose of listening to the environment. An exploration of our ear-environment relationship. Vesterkamp, 2006. Vesterkamp's notion of sound walk asserts the concept of dialogue and regards the environment as active and responsive. McCartney, 2006. Her approach to participatory sound walks establishes a respectful dialogue with other species and entities in the recording process and studio manipulation. Since very early in her artistic practice, she included her voice while recording the environment since she saw herself speaking in tandem with it. This plurality within her compositions rejects a notion of a Unitarian code that perfectly translates all meaning, common in totalitarian discourses. Instead, her work is situated within the struggle for language and the struggle against perfect communication, Hadaway, 91. Her compositions sway with a pendular motion between the listening sound work journey and her imagination, affect, and emotion. They're not a pristine reproduction on the environment, which is in itself impossible, but somehow remarkably enable the listener to embody her sound journey experience. The notion of dialogue embedded in her interstitial processes is vital in allowing listener participation. Subjective affective entanglement can dissipate otherness, and in this sense, embodied ecological challenges can be significant. Thinking about care concerning non-human animals is a tricky endeavor, especially when it comes to non-domestic animals. In domestic animal care, we commonly reinstate our anthropocentric Western heteropatriarchal notion of good care with its embedded hierarchy and discrimination, more important, less essential species, which is already questionable enough. We think for and decide for accordingly to our parameters of what is valuable and desirable. On the other hand, however, non-domestic animals many times do not exist or are neglected until, unless they are of use or important to us, through legal systems and political stances rooted in traditions and worldviews such as humanism and several monotheistic religions, we legit legitimize the control and destruction of individual non-human animals. Furthermore, the legitimization of discrimination by human animals against other sentient beings is even more complex and occurs on many cultural, discursive, psychological, and evolutionary levels. Speciesism is discrimination against individual beings based on their species membership. Corby and Lanjou, 2013. How to care for non-human animals and their environments. Can weaving emotional involvement, dialogue, and accompaniment into relations open new possibilities? Is it possible to think with, live with? Art is usually where one can find glimpses of resistance to hegemony. However, can a keener awareness and more emotional thinking patterns, such as caring, or non-instrumentalist perspectives towards nature, such as a companionment, come to play in essential roles in the ways of science and knowledge? Can care and techno science and nature cultures mean more than the responsible maintenance of technology and still not become a moral value just added to the thinking of things? Puig de la Bella Casa. How can we engage in dialogue, think with, live with nature, the environment, and non human animals without being reductive, romantic? or transferring or anthropocentric values. If other epistemologies, such as the ones just presented in this uh, text, propose frames of mind that could potentially reshape our relationships to nature that differ from the hegemonic mainstream ethical and marketing, would it be at all possible to incorporate them in the representation of things? So thank you for uh, listening to me. And these are the three concepts that I'm currently, as I mentioned before the text, um, delving in my artistic practice. I uh, do uh, uh, artistic pr practice research. And now I will show you a couple of uh, recent works where I have been trying to at least uh, put in um, practice, we could say, or from practice, delve uh, deeper into these concepts. This Niebla is an album that I was very happy to be able to uh, have in the record label Flaming Pines, directed by uh, amazing Kate Carr. And this album was released in March of this year. I will read a little bit about it. 
And this is a text uh, written by Kate, and it's posted on the Flaming Pines uh, Bandcamp site. In Niebla, we interrogate the mythologies, ecologies, and symbolism of the emblematic Quetzal bird, a creature sacred to both the Maya and Mexica civilizations. This album explores the entanglements of nature and culture, the human and non-human, using sound as a tool to heighten our empathy and sensitivity to our environments and the species who share our world. Situating, situating the listener within the Quetzal's cloud forest ecosystem, we insist upon a version of this location as both active and responsive, a place not of alienation, but of connection and engagement. Weaving together culture, affect, and interspecies encounter in six movements, this album explores our symbolic and emotional relationships with the environment and its dwellers through sound. And I have made a, um, a multimedia piece, especially uh, to be viewed with us from a screen. So if you're all, if you're able to put on headphones, I don't know if that's possible for you. That would be really great. And I will play this out. Al this album, like I said, is separated in six movements. But in this multimedia piece, it's just a long um, piece. So I will play this right now. I'll give you a couple of seconds or one minute to put on some headphones, if you will. Um, I don't know how much light there is in the place where you are right now. If you're able to turn off the lights, sit comfortably in your chair, but in an active, um, even though you're silent, and not moving with an active uh, disposition of the body. So I will do this now. And I guess I have to do a new share. So just bear with me. Mm -mm. Okay. So if you're ready, this is 20 minutes. So if you need to grab a drink of water or anything, and then just sit tight. Mm, no fool. I think we may have lost the sound. Uh, I'm sorry, I was asking if you're able to listen to the audio. I don't know if I turned it on correctly. Otherwise, I can replay this. I could I could hear it really nicely. Oh, yeah. OK. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, we'll start again. I was just uh, concerned about that. Thank you, Mark. No, I think it's um, maybe it's because it's coming out of um, your um, computer speakers, perhaps, and you've muted the mic, so it's not coming out. So I don't know is, if uh, Rory and Eka are there. Maybe they can. And select the sound.
Thank you for listening. So this was Niebla. And as you could uh, see and listen, I used very simple um, material to do it. The multimedia piece is thought, as I said, to uh, be watched on the screen. And I just used, as you could all see, just very uh, stock photography from the internet. And my idea was to uh, focus on the sound, you know, how we are so uh, visually driven. And then, so I, I thought, you know, I'm going to make something really simple and then just take the screen of blacks um, to focus on the listening. And this piece was inspired by the concept of sound walk from Westerkamp the vocal culture practice known as Kulning, which is really amazing. I don't know if you know about it. Uh, S. Borges' work on polyvagal theory and Durkheim's work on the study of interactional rituals and, and brain entrainment with binaural beats. So the whole composition was made with a couple of field recordings, uh, voice and just reverb and delay. So really simple elements. Like I said, I, I, I like to work with, with simple elements. Anyway, so yeah, continuing our presentation, I'm going to share the screen again. So this was Niebla. And this work kind of, uh, I feel with my, with research, like if I'm on a sailboat and that's what I was trying to explain the other day. And then just the, the research takes life on its own and it just takes me through different places. So that was, I think Niebla was a very important work for me because it just really helped me to focus where I was um, going to go. And as uh, I really enjoy working with binaural beats and simple sine waves and that combined with field recordings. And this, I uh, next thing I brought for you, I was recently uh, very lucky to be invited to this series of um, uh, sound meditations, which I think, I haven't asked, but I, I, I think they may be inspired on Paulino Oliveros. And so they're called Meditatio Sonos. It's a really amazing uh, cycle in Mexico. I think it's been going on for 10 years. And what I really like about this project is that, and this is something that I've been thinking about, about recently, um, what hybrid uh, projects can do for us. And what I love about this project is that it opens up something so specific like uh, sound art and so specific like meditation to all the public. And that's what I really like about it. You can see, uh, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, kids, uh, dogs, just everyone here. It's usually on, I think, Sundays, all the Sundays of a month. Anyway, to make the long story short, um, I brought for you to listen uh, the audio that we had been working on to present here. So it's not a finalized audio or anything, it's just a work a file that we were using to build this together. So I collaborated in this work with philosopher Maria Antonia Gonzalez Valerio, a dear friend of mine, and the director of the research group where I work, which is called Arte Mas Ciencia, and it's based in the Faculty of uh, Philosophy at the UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And I also collaborated with Jaime Lobato. He's also a great uh, musician, um, and what he did here, which was amazing, he does uh, this um, spectral synthesis, and he was uh, designing the sound in the space we uh, from my four speakers. So it was really amazing what he did. And what we tried to do, we did a combination, a hybridization between uh, Zen Buddhist uh, practice and field recordings and um, binaural beats. So I'm going to show you a couple of images and then we can listen to that. So that was us and it was really, really great. Uh, we tried to move from uh, the acoustic part of the um, presentation to the electronic part, to the acoustic part. And like I said, this is just a work um, 
file. I'm sorry that I don't have the recording of what actually happened there, which was really amazing. But yeah, so let's take a listen to that. So please let me know in the comments if you can hear to this, if you can listen to this well, since it's not master, uh, it doesn't have a master or anything. So just please let me know if it's too loud or too something. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you. Yes, I stopped it because he told me to share my screen. So I guess if I don't share the screen, we can't listen to it, right? So just give me one moment and I will do that. Thank you.
So this is one part of the two parts of this uh, two set performance. And I like to always include narratives and storytelling, although I don't tell anyone what I'm trying to, you know, what the story is about, but it just does help me to um, build a structure and to know where it is that I want to go. And this particular uh, two set performance is the two uh, parts are called Ocaso and Aurora, which in Spanish means uh, sunset and sunrise. And the first part, which is Aurora, is has uh, wonderful field recordings of um, birds of a specific ecosystem, which is the forest, um, eco, uh, fog forest in Chiapas. And the second part, the one that we're listening to right now, works with field recordings from the cloud forests in Veracruz. Those small uh, sounds that you just listened to, they're frogs. And I was, um, we won actually won an award for production uh, at the beginning of this year. And we were able to tra travel to the cloud forest in Veracruz. And these sounds were recorded outside of my bedroom. I had the most amazing room in the middle of the forest and uh, right next to a river. And in the river, well, the frogs, the frogs they were singing all night. And I just took a um, SM4 recorder, which is one of those recorders that they use in bioacoustics. And I set the recorder outside for the whole night. And those were the recordings that I could uh, retrieve. And they're really, really amazing because you could just listen to the frogs jumping from one side to the other. And it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful chorus. So I will stop this here because like I said, it's a, a work file, so it's pretty long and it doesn't have you know, that much of structure. But in any case, I think it's um, really important to be able to showcase um, works in progress, right? Because we're always accustomed to listening or seeing all these final pieces and being able to hear also the process uh, you know, kind of, I think it sometimes even helps us, you know, to our own processes or so where we are at. It's just that it's not that accustomed and sometimes it may, may make people nervous, you know, because you're in a way of being, uh, it's a way of being vulnerable between other people. But I think that's something really beautiful and important as well, because we're all, you know, uh, it's all part of a process and we're all learning. So anyway, that's that. And I will stop the audio file right now. And lastly, um, I wanted to move to this last work. Oh, hold on. It's still playing for me. Let me stop it. Where is it? Oh, it's okay. I can listen to it in the background. And this last work, it's a very recent project. I was just started it, I think, last month. And I'm going to share a screen again. And this is another hybrid uh, project that I've started with uh, musician Guillermo Guevara. And this time he is doing all the um, tones and sine wave tones. And we're focusing on one, just one uh, field recording. In this case, and I'm sorry, but I don't have a recording of this. You know how it sometimes is. You work so much to get to the um, concert, and when you're there, there's no one to record it. Anyway, so that's what happened here. But okay, what I wanted to get to is that we're working uh, with just one field recording. In this case, it's Ofaro Macruz Mochino, which is uh, Hilguero. I don't remember the name in English. I'm going to look for it right now, and then I'll tell you about it. And so basically our process is that we decide on one tone that we want to base our whole performance on. And so we're just exploring that one tone. And I think for me also, um, the uh, gestures are very important. So we had a really beautiful, like kind of a fish bowl with water. And we use one of these controllers that is called Touch Me. I don't know, maybe some of you know about it. 
and we put a few tones on the controller so the performance did start with the water me touching the water that you it was not the water that you could listen to but you know actually the tones that we selected for it and this was showcased at the uh cultural center of spain in mexico and we just did this probably about three weeks ago and i hope that we are invited for it again because we really love it okay and yeah so um i also like to work with um, lighting and us to create a overall atmosphere, a sense of atmosphere in the place. Um, my PhD studies were focused on the concept of atmosphere and embodied experience. So it's something that I am very interested in. And I think we just have a short video. This was taken with a phone, but anyway, it's 20 seconds long. So yeah, here it is. And I hope that please let me know if you're able to listen to it. Thank you. That's pretty much it. Let me reach the, oh, not yet. <laughs> These are a few texts that I'd like to share with you. Some of them I talked about. And yeah, so you probably are familiar with uh, her writings. And if not, this is Hildegard's um, site where you can read some of her writings. And Andra McCartney, who has already left this uh, plane, did write a lot about Hildegard. Her um, PhD was on her, and it's really, really amazing. It touches upon um, subjects of femininity and um, listening, and it's really great. I love her, her, her writings. This is a book that I have been has been um, with me for the last four years, and I'm still learning from it. This one is also really amazing, focusing on the birds as uh, their with their different idiosyncrasies and individualities. And this one was also really amazing. And that's me. Thank you. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Lena. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, I have some questions and I'm just going to encourage people to put their questions in the chat one more time. Oh, we've got a big one dropped in there. That's great. <laughs> um, I'll go straight to this actually. And then um, just keep popping your questions in the chat as we go. I've got lots of things to ask as well, but I'll, I'll start with what's here from um, Joseph. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, I have a question about the sounds as we hear them spatially in the Ebla. The drone sounds that appear intermittently sound like they come from nowhere, as opposed to the environmental sounds and the singing flutes, which are very reverberant and really convey, to me at least, a sense of diffusing in particular spaces. Sometimes it seemed to me as though the singing and the bird sounds were in the same space. I wonder if you could talk about how you understand the relationship among these various spaces in the piece. Well, thank you, Joseph. That's a super interesting question. Yeah, well, um, again, I work with uh, storytelling, and I don't know if I should tell the story of this particular work. I guess I will. And yeah, so about this uh, different sounds. So the story is about women that live in the forest. And this is something that I didn't talk about, but I usually approach um environmental sound and bioacoustics from the perspective of fiction. And that's a long story we'll be told in, a, in another talk. But anyway, um, this is a story of women that are walking in the cloud forest and they are going to this specific place near a cascade and they're going to perform a ritual there. 
to see if they're able to listen and if they're able to make the um the Quetzal bird appear, right? So they're walking and they're singing and then they get to this place and then they start calling it and then the bird appears and then they start singing together and then they fuse it to some something <laughs> that is out of this uh, world, I guess, or out of this plane of, of existence. And that's a story. So yes, uh, you're right. Um, for from one part is these environmental sounds and the voices and and there's no flute it's just the voice that is hitting that tone and we worked a lot with one tone there and just make it you know really there's a moment where you don't know if it's the voice or a flute or what but it's just that one tone with the voice and so they're together in this space but then the beats they're supposed to at least that's what i uh, tried <laughs> to ground the person who is listening in their space. So I don't know if that makes any sense. And if I answered your question. Thank you, Maina. Um, what's this? Robert Burton has put, oh, and Joseph said, yes, it does. Thank you very much. <laughs> Robert's put, this sounds Aztec inspired, um, which is a broad statement, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I wouldn't know how that sounds, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Um, I was going to just go back actually to the to the voice in that um, piece that you were just talking about. And like, what's the process of sort of voice and interacting with sort of animals and environments? Are you, are you physically voicing and doing voice work in situ like in environments or is it all kind of in the edit like how does that work no it is definitely done in the environment mm -hmm. and it's part of the uh, practice-based research and what i love about voice <laughs> and it's just something that i'm i guess i was for a long time searching my own like i thought how could, how do i participate of course i do participate in the sound environment just by being there and breathing and walking but i think i, I wanted to participate and I just um, thought the voice was the best, at least for me at this moment, because it's ephemeral and you it, it places yourself within the space and you're able to um, listen to the acoustics of the space. And yeah, I guess that it's just a work in progress, but I am very interested in figuring out different ways of how to sing with, if that makes any sense. So yes, totally. And I, I even moved to the forest six months ago, and that was part of my, um, yeah, so I'm very decided on it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And, and do you, out of interest, do you have like a training in like voice and singing or anything like that? Oh, but that's something I have to say. This uh, Niebla was performed by Vania Fortuna, singer. So, yes, yeah, she is a professional uh, singer. And mm. me, I'm just uh, starting out with uh, professional training. Yeah, I've been just at that probably for a year or so. So, yeah, but that's her and that's her composition. She's a really amazing, amazing artist. Amazing. Um, but a question from Saya who asks, how do you approach the post-production of sounds? Yeah. Uh, do you have an idea of what effects or editing you will do when you are recording planning or is it more experimental kind of when you're editing in the moment? Uh, thank you for your question, Saya. So... No, I think uh, I don't have any plans when I'm recording. I just um, do field work. Just I want to be surprised and I don't have any plans. I, I, I go out and record and perhaps I don't record anything or I don't use anything of the recordings that I make, you know, and then maybe just one after. Well, people who do field recordings know that, of course, <laughs> you can be searching for recordings for many days and then. Yeah, you don't really have anything, but you know, one of those days you do. And no, I guess I don't have any plans. It has to do with um, the recording surprised me in a way. And then I, uh, I plan a story and then the story just takes me through the um, effects or, you know, I have to create first a space and, and, and then the story will just help me create the atmosphere that I think makes sense with, with that story. 
Great. But it's also something I, I do want to say, and it's been a journey for me to know what to do with field recordings that I hold very, very precious. It's hard, you know? So do you want to cut them, edit them? I don't know. I, I think sometimes it just even takes me days to think of how to approach it with respect and honor and correctly, if there's any sense of using that word. So yeah, it does take a while. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? It's kind of like the ethics of editing as well and thinking about whether one should cut or, you know, like when is it right to do that? When is it not? And the idea of permission is really interesting, especially when you're dealing with environments and species, multi-species, like it's kind of where does consent lie and where is permission? It's all very, um, very interesting stuff. Um, just on the back of that question, actually, I was thinking about the field and the edit suite and like is there just a really open question I suppose around like the differences or the similarities and the overlaps between what it's like you know recording in the field versus editing in the sort of studio let's say um, do those sites uh, do, do they feel totally different is the listening that you do different in those kind of sites like just what I wonder what that relationship is between the field and the studio Oh, that's a pretty good question. I guess, yes, of course, they're different. Um, but I let me think in which way. <laughs> I guess there's a difference between listening in the field and then just doing, uh, you know, listening for a final production. You know, when you're just getting your piece to be ready to send somewhere, then of course, that's completely different. You know, you're trying to. Um, mix the best that you can, and highlight this, highlight that, speci specialize it. But uh, I guess that the recording done in the field is, at least in the first stages, I try to make silence of myself as much as possible so that I'm able to listen. And this is also a really in interesting thing. And this is just, I'm just going to mention it because it's just something that I will discover. I'm going to pretty soon be starting an amazing, amazing collaboration with um, Francisca Salaquet. And she is a sound archaeologist and has worked closely with Maya culture for many years. And she was telling me the story that I really loved. And as she was going through um, the, the La Selva La Candona, you know, in the southeast of Mexico, with um, some Maya colleagues, she was telling me, you know, Lena, how we have to make silence to listen? You and me? I said, yeah. <laughs> well, they don't. <laughs> she says, we're just walking, chatting, this and that. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, shh, stop. This is going on. This is going on. This is going on. I thought, oh, wow. You know, so I guess, yeah, um, it is different to listen to in the field and, and listening to the student. I'm just trying to broaden my way of listening as much as I can. And I guess that my, I don't know if there's any goal, but something that I have very close in my heart and in my mind, I'm just trying to figure out a way how we can talk with and live with. And this just, you know, every day it becomes different and I have different ideas every week. So we'll see what happens with that. And I don't know if I just went to a tangent line there, Mark, with your question. That was brilliant. I love that. It makes me think it actually, you know, like there's the two things in the talk that were really interesting for me as well was the, the you know, the very start um, sort of preparation and the, the kind of pulse heartbeat meditation that we all did together. And then um, thinking about, I think when, when you were playing the, the work on Flaming Pines, you kind of invited us all to, you know, get comfortable, like, turn the lights off if you want to like you know you're really like aware of setting up a space for listening and, and not just pressing play kind of thing so it felt very much like and, and obviously the, the work you showed towards the end as well it was really interesting to see people in space listening or outside and listening and and like do you have a kind of certain I feel like we've kind of answered this to some extent or, or approached it a lot today but is there, is there a certain listening kind of state that you, you want to invite people into? Yes. Thank you for that question. And I guess that has to do with my PhD and 
Uh, yeah, I, I was really love. I think that one of the ways of making the distance between with the others just narrower, you know, and, and I think the narrowing of this distance uh, promotes empathy, which I think is very important, is through embodied experience. And so the sound, you know, and, and being able to connect uh, pre-intellectually, if it makes any sense. Um, and that's at least at this point, and after all those years of studying, th that particularly uh, mechanism, we could say, that's uh, through, um, and I lost my chain of thought. I wanted to say, yeah, embodiment by being able to, uh set the space so it creates a certain disposition in the bodies that's what i wanted to say and yeah so i am totally interested in in that that's cool um i there was something you said that, that this is probably me being um maybe mishearing or something but you i was just really intrigued you said something like there was a, a phrase that was like brain entrainment with binaural beats at some point came mm -hmm. into this and I just wrote this quick note going what's that I want to hear more about brain entrainment and binaural beats could you say a little bit more about that yes so there's this uh theory that you could do brain entrainment with sound and you know that's by um using uh and I have them right here on my cheat sheet um sounds and frequencies for example you want to take people from uh, beta, beta state to delta state, supposedly. Theta and delta states are the states of uh, deeper uh, meditation and uh, states that you reach also in your sleep. And uh, beta is from 12 hertz to 27 hertz, alpha from 8 to 12 hertz, theta from 3 hertz to 8, and delta from 0.2 hertz to 3 hertz. Of course, this is not an exact science, and, and this is something that I really love. Um, from one part, I, I work with scientific facts, we could say. And then on the other side, I like to work with, we could say, different uh, epistemologies that, you know, you don't have any way of proving in a sense, but that they do exist. So, yeah. So um, using, I use sine waves, but for example, if I use sine waves with this on one, uh, if, when I, if you're talking about a stereo sound, if you put one tone on one uh, ear and then the other one on the other one, and between those two tones, there's a separation of three hertz, eight hertz, 27 hertz, uh, you're able to create a beating. And that beating is in one of these uh, frequencies. So the idea and what we did, for example, in Meditatio Sonus, and I do that as well in Niebla, and I'm just delving further and further into this because it really interests me, is uh, taking people from like their conscious state to a more meditative state. And this, of course, in the interest of uh, promoting uh, uh, bodily engagement and openness to the sound and the experience. Thank you. That's fascinating. <laughs> um, can I just ask you again about the fiction and storytelling kind of aspect? Because it it's come up a lot. And do, do you write fictions like are you writing the sort of stories and narratives and then compositions and ideas are coming through that or uh not really i think it has to but this is a really great question because it's something that i've learned recently and i've been working with scientists and in the intersection of art and science for the last uh, oh, 11 years and it's always been complicated you know to work really within disciplines, interdisciplinary. But it just recently I understood that um, sharing and talking and working from fiction is a great place because, and specifically with scientists, but now I think it's with everybody because you're, um, for example, when you're working with a scientist and you know they need to prove whatever it is that they're saying, right? Or they're studying and they go into the field with this mindset. And I think that this mindset sometimes just, it's a predisposition. You hear and you find what you're trying to find. So working from fiction just sets yourself from a completely different standpoint. 
And even though you are who you are trained to be, I mean, we cannot escape the context or historical, whatever it is, if we went to school and studied this and that. Trying to, uh, what I'm trying to say is that a scientist will always think like a scientist. <laughs> but if you're able to create a story and talk uh, with them from the point of fiction or from the perspective of fiction, then they are, again, in a sense, free to say whatever it is, you know, um, there's this place that I've been working with, uh, no, at in Mexico City. Anyway, uh, it's a biological reserve in the middle of the city. And I, I remember how we were always uh, figuring out, like, how did this bird come here? You know, like, what is this bird doing here in the middle of, let's say, January? And it doesn't make any sense. And it's by itself. And and they have no answer. Right. But but if you approach from fiction, I said, I, I know that you can't prove it. I know that you're not writing a paper about it, and I know you're not going to include it in your research. But what do you, th how do you think this bird got here? Like, just, you know, let's approach it from somewhere else. This is not going to be written. <laughs> no one is going to know about it. Let's just fly and, and think how this all happened. So I think that fiction, I don't write the stories. It's just fiction. I, I found in fiction the best way to be able to communicate and create uh, among interdisciplinary Lee. So yeah, so I guess it's a story for every work. And it just starts with the uh, hands on research. Mm, that's fantastic. What, what a great answer. Thank you for that. that was brilliant. Um, maybe we'll uh, just one more question before we wrap up. I was wondering, a, a sort of broad and maybe a personal question really in terms of like how how you found sound I suppose or, or listening practices and how you actually um how you got got into this field which we're all here today there's lots of us but it is fairly niche <laughs> and it is fairly um specific I always think we're all sound nerds here and it's a lovely community but I just wonder how you got into it all well I have to say that um as I was in my bachelor's I was always interested and I had to, I, I said I had to study design because, you know, at that time going into arts was not like, okay, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> but I was always very interesting and sound, interested in sound arts. But at the time I didn't think I could do it. You know, it's like, it's, it was a very, uh, sometimes it still is, but a very male dominant, uh, at least from where I was standing place. And I didn't think I could do it. Right. And then um, I was in 2014, I think, I did a residency at Cultivamos Cultura with amazing artist Marta de Meneses, and she directs that place. And Eric Berger, he was there. And he, he is also an amazing artist and, and researcher. And he had a, a, a recorder at that time. And we had to make a piece in 30 days and there was nothing. It's like in the middle of rural uh, Portugal. So I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But there was this really old and beat up uh, mixer and some really not good microphones and that recorder. And I remember Eddie, he told me, here, here you go, go, go record. And I said, okay. You know, and I was, I, I've, I've been always been very close to, to the uh, nature and I grew up um, spending all my summers in the uh, forests of California. So I guess that was always there. But it was at that time and at that um, uh, time in, in, in space with that recorder in hand that, oh, and then Eddie, he, t he showed me how to do feedback with the mixer. And I also, uh, there were some really old um, things lying around the house and I built instruments out of them. It was just like all really just natural, you know, and, and, and that was it. <laughs> I never looked back. So I did a really cool um, concert with all these instruments that I built and the recordings that I recorded and that feedback. So that was really great. That's brilliant. Thank you. I love that. It's like just sort of getting into something through doing, you know, so, so great. Okay. I think we'll, we'll finish there, Lena. Thank you again. That thank was you so much. Really brilliant. Thank you so, so much. And um, thank you everyone for, for being here and I'll see you next week. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Lots of thank yous coming in on the chat. <laughs>